seasonal production and it, uh, the theme of that project is uh, what the theme of this map webinar is understanding climate predictability and advancing predictions but focusing on the seasonal to seasonal uh, time scales. Uh, so just, as, just as a background, there's a lot of climate variability which happens on the sub-seasonal seasonal time scales. Uh, it has both beneficial or uh, adverse impacts. So just some examples here. Uh, you all know living in North America, the, the, this winter has been 2013-14 winter has been way below normal and we all tired of shuffling by, by now in front of our houses. There was a lot of U.S. flooding uh, happened this year uh, and led to a lot of damages uh, over the U.K. Uh, 2013, there were a lot of uh, Australians suffered uh, through a very extreme wildfire season. So these are things happening on the bad side, uh, the bad extremes which affect the society in a negative way. Uh, and it's a, events because of events happening on the sub time scale. On the other hand, uh, the 2013 Atlantic hurricane season was one of the lowest, and it's another kind of extreme, but uh, in this way, but this kind of extremes benefits, probably had some benefit to the society. So these things happen both in the negative or positive way in terms of their influence on the society, and, and, and uh, one would like to predict these things uh, on a with a shorter lead time or, or with some skill or with some success. Uh, so that's what this project is about. Uh, so there are some questions related to predictions on this time scale. There are some research questions and there are some very pragmatic and, and practical questions in terms of how to put the forecast systems targeting this time scale. So the slide three basically sort of describe some of the research questions which uh, which we are facing. So for example, what's the predictability on this time scale? How much you can predict? How much you cannot predict? Uh, what are the sources of predictability? For example, stratospheric tropospheric interactions, soil moisture, uh, CI, SST, or different, different possible sources of predictability, uh, simulations of MGO or interseasonal oscillations, uh, what are the tropical, extratropical interactions, Simulations of monsoons and its predictability using climate models or, or the weather and climate prediction models. Variability of rainfall and, and causes for the extremes, whether it can be predicted or not, how they are related to large scale circulation features. Uh, there's a notion of uh, the, the connections between the spread and skill and can that be used as a forecast of opportunity so if we have ensemble predictions and for one set of predictions if the, the spread is small then is that an indication that the skill is going to be higher or what kind of relationship exists. Uh, sea ice has been declining last 25 years and there's a lot of debate and controversy or uh, interesting issues how it's going, how is it changing the the circulation characteristics and the extratropical latitudes and what might be the implications for uh, predictability on a sub time scale. So these are some of the research questions we are facing. Uh, slide four basically describes or, or puts down some of the issues which are related to the design of the forecast systems. So what's the best way to initialize or generate the perturbations uh, for the ensemble prediction systems? Uh, what, what's the best design of the forecast system so you can run, uh, I'll show it later, some of the some of the centers run these things in a continuous mode, some run in a burst mode, what's the required resolution, uh, what kind of coupling you need to make a best sub predictions, and how to verify these uh, these forecasts. So, so the context of the practical issues is, is we have a limited amount of resources. And there's a fairly big amount of trade space. You can change things. You can change the resolution, change the ensemble size, and the, the question comes back is, uh, what would be the best uh, returns of, what strategy to take which leads to a, a best, best return in terms of the investments you are making? Uh, so it's a very practical questions, but still an unresolved or unsolved problem. So some some of the research and modeling issues I'm describing could be addressed if you have a a data set or a, a multi-model data set uh, which could be used to uh, look at these issues both in the research and in the 
in the terms of the design, the forecast uh, system. So that's what this uh, S2S prediction project is. Uh, it's an international project between the coordinate between the World Weather Research Program and World Climate Research Program. It's unique in that way that it, it intersects both the weather and the climate community. And the concept of this uh, project is to basically collect the data from a different operational prediction system at a particular place and then disseminate it to the research community so it can be used to address uh, some of the research and, and practical questions. And and then you'll hear to the next talk by Ben, which is just something very similar going is also happening over the US, US as part of the North American multimodal experiment. Uh, slide six, so uh, there's some milestones. There was first workshop which led to this project in Met Office in 2011. Implementation plan is ready and is on posted on the web, and I'll give you the link on the last slide in March 2013. Uh, last month, we hosted the first S2S workshop in NSEP, which was supported by uh, CPU map program, and it happened during a snow event, so that created a lot of logistic, logistical issues for us for me at least. And the submission of data, first data set should start to appear by 2014. Uh, so the concept basically is to collect the data uh, from different operational centers, which produce the monthly prediction, which have the monthly pr uh, prediction systems, and this data will be, will be both for the hindcast and the real-time forecast. And the purpose is listed in the next three bullets. It's basically the, the mission or the uh, sort of a what this program is about uh, is to improve the forecast skill and understanding on sub predictions to promote the uptake of these data sets from the operational, some operational centers by the, uh, by the user community. Uh, moving on to uh, slide eight, uh, this basically uh, describes the, what the data sets would be. Uh, it'll be in GRIP2 format, individual model runs both for hindcast and uh, for the real-time forecast. Uh, the people who don't like the GRIP2, which is GRIP format, which is basic, uh, which is a WMO standard for exchanging the data between uh, operational centers. ECMWF will provide some wrappers which will allow you to extract or deal or play with the data in the net CDF format. Uh, what we have agreed upon is to exchange the data on a one by half, one by half degree. Resolutions and about 100 variables and the list of these variables came from uh, getting the input from various uh, various task force like MGO task force or other uh, panels within the WCRP or CLIVE or like Monsoon um, panel, etc. Uh, data will be archived at the ECMWF and disseminated to the community from there. Uh, and the first test data again will start to be appear in uh, July 2014. Slide nine uh, gives you a outlay of uh, different operational centers which are uh, producing monthly forecast data and have indicated uh, their willingness to give the data to this uh, as part part of this project. So this is going to the first column here, the ECMWF, Med Office, NSEP, Environmental Canada, uh, Cocker is the Bureau of Meteorology, JMA, KMS, uh, China, CMA, Media France, uh, SOS relates to a Southern Medical Service in South uh, Africa, and this HMCR, the last column, is uh, the operational center in, in Russia. So there's a fair amount of centers we are which are producing these forecasts and will be submitted to this uh, this database. Uh, this is not a very good slide, but I just uh, cut and pasted the list of variables uh, that different centers have agreed to archive. Uh, this exceeds about hundred, it's about 100 variables as multi-level fields from geopotential height, specific humidity, temperature, UVW, the uh, standard things we look at. There's a list of single level variables, uh, for example, the surface flux of it and the top of the atmosphere and some things related to uh, things like CAPE or uh, looking at the convective uh, instability and things like that. There's some ocean fields and then some, some constant fields. Uh, it still remains to be seen which center is going to provide some data, uh, which 
work variables, but uh, still has a fairly good scope or usefulness when this data comes along. So last slide here uh, shows gives you the, the the cover page of the implementation plan and the web link, which can download and, and look through the implementation plan, is about 40 to six, uh, about 50 to 60 pages. And hopefully, uh, going forward in time, in a year from now, this data set will be will be established in this place and will be a very useful tool for the research community to address issues related to predictability or and also the design of the forecast systems uh, which target the subseasonal seasonal forecast. Uh, that's all. And if you have any questions, I then probably want to do that at the end or whichever you want. Yeah, sure. No, we'll do that now. Thanks a lot, Arun. That was an interesting talk, a really useful research data set that's going to be produced from this project. So um, I haven't received any questions from attendees on the phone yet. If you have any questions, please send a chat message to me and I can unmute your line. Um, but I'll check and see if there are any questions here in the room. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Rune, this is Rick Rose, and thank you for that uh, uh, concise overview. Uh, your last slide here, I think, uh, is worth noting that, uh, indeed, this S2S project is uh, under the auspices of the World Weather Research Program, but it's being done in collaboration, I gather, with, with the World Climate Research Program. Correct, yeah. So this is one, this is one of the uniqueness of this project is that connects both with the WWRP and WCRP. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that's uh, an interesting trend to see uh, uh, in the international community to see that uh, collaboration uh, moving forward. Correct, yeah. Any other questions here in the room? Okay, well, I haven't seen anything from um, virtual attendees, so I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Thanks a lot, Arun. I appreciate the talk. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Ben, are you on the line? Yes. Great, I'm gonna switch control over to your computer. Okay. And I just click on share my desktop, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, um, I want to echo uh, Arun's uh, thanks um, uh, for uh, CPO for organizing this and everybody who's attending also. Um, so this is uh, intended just to, uh, um, to provide an update of um, uh, some of the new and exciting things that are going on in the NMME project. and. And a little bit of how that's dovetailing with the uh, climate prediction uh, task force. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, I suppose it comes as no surprise that I'm talking about NMME uh, yet again. Um, so uh, clearly it's a project that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, the first thing I want to note is the NCAR data server is up online and, and uh, it keeps growing every single day, the amount of data in there. And, and uh, so if anybody wants the link, or doesn't have the link to that uh, data server, let me know. Uh, make sure you get it. It's uh, broadcast, that link to that data server is broadcast every month uh, for those people that are on the NMME mailing list. And anybody who wants to get on the NMME mailing list, there's a link on the CPC site. So there's my advertising. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the real-time activity because there's a couple of new things going on there that are that are interesting. Uh, so I'm going to focus on some of this uh, real-time verification that's going on, or near real-time verification, I should say. Um, there's some additional variables, but I'm not going to talk about that today. There is a new model that just for this most recent forecast uh, has become uh, uh, um, uh, real-time. And that's the new GFDL floor model. There's actually two versions of it, uh, so there's a little bit of model proliferation going on. Um, the next thing I want to talk about after that is um, uh, the sub-seasonal uh, protocol experiment. The, the runs for this have actually been done, and so I want to show you some results that we have from that. Uh, I will emphasize that, that uh, for example, my runs as, that I'm going to show you for that um, just finished uh, this week. So um, you're looking at very uh, raw results. Uh, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is the um, uh, model update. So I'll show a result 
you know, uh, from floor demonstrating that it's improved, but also um, the upgrade to CCSM. We're going from three to four, and we're hoping that, um, or we're shooting for having uh, that one get into the real-time system uh, either uh, late spring or, or early uh, summer. And then the last thing I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Climate Prediction Task Force white paper. But you can see it's a very long list, so um, if I don't get through everything, um, forgive me. Uh, but I will, I, I, I will try not to rush the slides, though. But, uh, uh, so just in terms of the real time, for those of you that don't check the website out uh, frequently, uh, we, are, we are putting out probabilistic forecasts. These are probabilistic forecasts that are based on an order of 100 member ensemble. Um, so this is uh, the most recent one month lead probabilistic forecast for sea surface temperatures for April, May, June. And so you can see the probability for above normal, uh, below normal, and, and near neutral. And so there is a, a relatively high probability of SSTs being above normal in the tropical Pacific, but also in much of the uh, Atlantic, too. Uh, the next slide is showing you the uh, uh, rainfall probability forecast for the same, same lead, same season, uh, same forecast. Um, and of course, um, uh, you can see that uh, it's producing uh, relatively dry conditions in, in uh, California and wet in Mexico and then relatively dry in the uh, central U.S. Um, one of the new uh, exciting things I, that's happening with the, uh, the website is an attempt to do a, a running or real-time uh, verification. And this particular one for this particular season is a very interesting one. So what we're looking at is the, uh, this is a, presented in a deterministic framework. So this is showing you um, the uh, uh, NMME forecast, uh, the bottom two left, oh, I can use my mouse. So this one and this one are the NMME forecast. So this is the average. This one is the deterministic forecast, just the raw ensemble mean. And this is the probabilistic forecast. Uh, uh, made in November, verifying in December, January, February. So one one lead, and then this is what this is the observed uh, temperature. And Arun actually mentioned this earlier that you know the U.S. was uh, under a great you know uh, much of North America was very very cold, except for the southern tip of Florida there that you can almost see or where I sit. Not not boasting or anything. Um, and then the, the individual models are are listed across across here again the. The uh, deterministic forecast, and I, I think if you're if you're a, a glass half full kind of guy, you would say that there's some hint that you know maybe half the models or slightly more than half the models had some hint of there being uh, extreme uh, cold throughout much of North America. But if you're a half half empty kind, glass kind of guy, you would say it's a total a total bust in the forecast. So this is um, a, a real interesting case is why did the models struggle so much in, in this uh, particular uh, case? Was it that there, there was no uh, real climate forcing signal or is this something the models just can't do and there is some predictability? So these are um, really good questions that come out of the, the real-time activity. Um, the bar graphs uh, show you the uh, area average anomaly correlation um, for North America on the top and then just CONUS at the bottom. And uh, what's typical with a lot of these is the NMME system is not necessarily the best, but it's certainly among the best of the individual models in the top two or three usually. And the high key skill score uh, is shown in uh, the bottom there. Uh, so uh, NMME is well into phase two, and so we are obviously continuing uh, the real-time activity. Uh, model upgrades are, are uh, well in progress. So the GFDL floor system, for example, just, just came online. Uh, CCSM4, we're getting quite close to having that come online. The uh, data servers, including three hourly, six hourly, 24 hourly, monthly mean fields, it's 189, 189 2D fields total, so it's a big data set. So it's taking a lot of effort to get there. The, the core output at the moment is going to be this 24-hourly output that is, that is flowing as we speak, um, and, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at. The um, 
another uh, interesting element of phase two is this, uh, to try to think a little bit about um, uh, the subseasonal timescales, you know, dovetailing nicely with what, what Arun was talking about. And here we're, we're really looking at a, a potential protocol for how to do that. And uh, so we've set up a, a test bed, if you will, for doing that. And uh, the parameters of that experiment uh, are focused from the 1999 to 2009 uh, years, and uh, these these are November starts only. So you can see we're really we're really uh, having a core a focused uh, effort. Just November starts, and so we're starting every five days in November, starting on November 2nd. And uh, uh, we the runs are a minimum of 45 days. I did mine for 60 just because that's easier to do. And one of the things we want to look at is this notion of bursts, which is the way I'm doing these forecasts, versus every six hours. So uh, uh, CFS V2 does it a forecast every six hours, and, uh, and NASA uh, also does a forecast every six hours, but is also doing the burst. So uh, we have a nice way of looking at um, a, the, a protocol for the subseasonal time scale here in this experiment. Um, uh, before I get to results um, on that subseasonal, I did want to uh, talk about some of the applications of the of the seasonal forecast protocol. So this is the phase two data from CCSM4, but what I'm doing here is actually taking the daily data from CCSM4 and using that to uh, force WaveWatch 3. It's a nice application model, and so uh, the results here are looking at um, uh, anomaly correlation. Uh, with uh, daily forced, although we accumulated into monthly means as output, but significant wave heights, uh, the four left panels are the correlation and the four, these uh, four right panels are saturation RMSE. And so you can see all the way out to, you know, four, maybe even um, in some places out to seven months, there's some, some indication that we can actually make uh, uh, forecasts of um, a significant wave height. And we're starting to look at that from a, a, a probabilistic level also. Um, okay, so this very ugly, uh, hideous slide, now that I look at it more carefully, it's truly hideous. Um, so what is this? This is actually getting started to look at that subseasonal protocol. So I'm just making a plot here for 60 days. Uh, these are time longitude sections just along the equator of the 200 millibar zonal wind. And to read this plot, you start down here. This is November 2nd, and it runs all the way through uh, December 31st. And these are uh, 200 millibar zonal wind anomalies along the equator. This first panel here on the left is the observed. And then these are um, hindcasts, and this is from, Dece uh, from November 2006. And this is ensemble members one through three from uh, CCSM4. And um, I, I, again, it depends on if you're a half full or half empty glass <laughs> kind of guy, uh, what you see. But um, at least for the first 20 days or so, there is some consistent, you know, uh, um, a negative anomalies and some hints that even at longer leads that there's some uh, predictability. Whoops, I didn't mean to go forward there some predictability of the subseasonal variability. We have, to be, we have to be very careful in looking at this because I'm going to show you another picture in a second and it'll be more apparent, but, but there really is um, uh, large-scale forcing here also, which is driving, you know, a lot of that background uh, easterlies in the, in the uh, uh, anomalies in the Pacific. Uh, and then, you know, you can also see uh, the, the models think there's some predictability of this signal, but of course there's no, no imprint of this a particular uh, fast-moving signal in the Indian Ocean late, late in the uh, forecast period. Uh, if we uh, take a look at the, so oh, that should say 2007, I apologize. This is now 2007, same format, uh, observed 200 millibar uh, wind anomalies, and then the three ensemble members. And so you can see, ah, I keep doing that, oh, sorry. You can see that there's, um, uh, uh, some predictability, you know, out to, you know, maybe even 20 days in some of the signal. You can see the large-scale imprint, and you can see a lot of, of, 
a, a fair amount of consistency among the ensemble members. So the ensemble members may be thinking there's more predictability than there than than maybe there is in terms of forecast skill. But but um, uh, there's some some things to be you know encouraged by when you look at these uh, forecasts, at least for the first uh, for 20 days. But but even uh, some of the signal uh, for a little bit longer. And of course, the the thing I wanted to emphasize with this sub seasonal is this uh, 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 bursting, if you will, that every five days we do a we do an ensemble plume because um, we want to look at the you know the overall uh, evolution here. And so this is these are lined up so the verification days are the same. So um, this is the forecast that were initialized on November second. Uh, the far left is the forecast that were initialized on November seventh and and so you can see there really is um, uh, early in the forecast, particularly in the Pacific, but also some hints in the Indian Ocean, that there is some signal that the model is um, able, you know, some deterministic signal, if you will, that the model is able to, to uh, pick up um, uh, in both, both of the forecasts. There's no verification here. I uh, should be careful. This is just how well is the model uh, predicting itself. And you can say a similar thing for the November uh, 2007. And, and so last night I, I did sort of scroll through all of these forecasts and look at a lot of these pictures, and it's pretty easy to convince yourself that you think you're seeing something, but um, you know some robust statistics is required here yet to, to really make an assessment. And, and we do need to be careful uh, in that you know a lot of that a lot of the signal here is the large scale um, or the the low frequency uh, forcing uh, model updates. Um, so uh, just showing you results from CCSM uh, 4, this is um, uh, January initial conditions. This is uh, the top two panels are forecasts of uh, two meter temperature using all of our January starts. These are one season leads. Um, uh, the, the left panel is the upper left is CCSM 3, the upper right is CCSM 4. Um, so um, just to remind you, if you don't remember, the CCSM3, we didn't actually uh, initialize the land surface at all, so, uh, or the atmosphere. We just initialized the ocean. The climatology was used for the other, other components. And in CCSM4, we are initializing land, and we are initializing the atmosphere based on CFSR data. You can see we're getting some, uh, some benefit, some real benefit there. Certainly, some of the benefit is the initial condition, but also some of the benefit could be the model. Um, improvements with CCSM4, and then the bottom panel is showing you the JFM uh, uh, SST correlation coefficient, CCSM3 versus CCSM4. And actually, we've quantified this uh, improvement by uh, by using CCSM4 with identical initial conditions as CCSM3. And so I would say I would say it's half and half that half of this improvement is due uh, in part of what we think is a better initial condition and half is actually due to a, a, a better model. So uh, that's encouraging. The model actually matters to some degree. Floor, uh, this is the GFDL. This slide is courtesy of um, uh, uh, Gabe Vecchi. And uh, so this is just showing you the, the uh, squ squared error skill score for Nino 3.4 for floor, for floor, which is their new system, and for CM 2.1. And the, the, other than some model improvements, and there are some real model improvements here, uh, the sort of philosophical difference uh, or philosophical way of going forward with floor is a lot of the emphasis is put into increased resolution in the atmospheric component as opposed to the ocean component. So they're really trying to push the envelope of the atmospheric resolution. I believe this one here is 50 kilometers. I may have that wrong, but I believe it's 50 kilometers. Whereas the ocean, they're leaving it around uh, one degree globally, telescoping in the tropics. So the real, the real uh, sort of philosophical push with floor is to push the atmospheric component, and they're arguing that they're getting uh, a big bang for their buck uh, in terms of forecast skill from just that. Um, and so you can see uh, this is this. Uh, so red values are better, and blue values are, are are not as good. And so you can see just just about every lead time and every initial condition. Um, uh, uh, floor is uh, uh, is uh, beating CM 2.1. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so the last thing I, I haven't got, I haven't noticed the hook yet. So, so um, I no, think no I hook yet. Time. You're doing well. Oh, okay, good. So the last the last the last thing I just wanted to mention was this uh, Climate Prediction Task Force uh, white paper. And actually, I want to I want to mention two things. I, I, I after I sent the slides around, I forgot. I realized I had uh, not mentioned the second thing. So the Climate Prediction Task Force has two major activities just at the moment that we're really, really trying to uh, either finish up or, or, or push hard to, uh, uh, to get going. The first one is this finishing up this white paper, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it in a minute. The second is we want to we wanna actually uh, uh, have a, a virtual workshop, and that's a real, we want to have a real workshop on a, on a specific prediction issue. In this case, we're, we're we're, uh, we've drilled down for the first of these as on um, bias correction, and so you can you can think of this workshop that we're planning as as a as a twofold experiment. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we you know we want to we want to see if we uh, can make some progress on thinking about doing a, a more sophisticated bias correction in in real prediction systems, and um, the second element of this. Uh, workshop is testing this notion of actually doing a virtual workshop. So it's sort of a two a, a, a two tiered uh, or a two pronged uh, experiment. Um, and so um, you know if you're if you're interested in participating, we really want to encourage you to attend. If you have if there will be a call for uh, uh, submissions of papers to present at this vir virtual workshop, and we're hoping that that this might be a mode uh, it can't replace. Face-to-face um, uh, -face workshops, but it might be a mode for uh, dealing with specific issues, getting them on the table rapidly, and, and making progress, and, and sort of being a, a, a bridging the gap between you know doing individual research and actually uh, attending face-to-face -face workshops. So those are the two sort of core activities, and I, I just want to touch on the on the white paper for just a moment. And so. Um, I'm going to pick on, on, on my student and some work I've done with my student first is a bit of the motivation for this, just a bit of the motivation. The white paper does a lot of things, but, but one of the things it, that uh, I think we're, what's emerging from the task force is this fact that um, it's very difficult to get predictability research to actually advance operational prediction. It's not really getting into uh, how the forecasters um, uh, look at forecasts, and it's, it's difficult to see the imprint of predictability directly. I'm sure in the long run there's some impact, but we want to try to accelerate that. And so this first paper that I'm picking on of my students is um, uh, in some sense an example of why um, predictability, it's difficult for predictability research to get into prediction. And so uh, this is a nice piece of work that Sarah has done, but, but it's completely in context of a long-running model, uh, you know, CCSM4, and she's able to show that the Pacific meridional mode is a, is a good precursor for ENSO. So that's, an, you know, that's, that's yet another long list of potential precursors for El Nino, uh, but it's not clear if you're a forecaster if that's, if that's at all useful information. And so the next slide, I asked Sarah to, to really, you know, be tough and ask, ask is the, this Pacific Meridional Mode a useful tool, is it potentially a useful tool for the real forecast problem? And so what she did here in this more recent paper is she actually attacked the whole NMME data set and asked, is the uh, Pacific uh, Meridional Mode a precursor for, for El Nino events? And if you just, I'm about to sneeze, I'm sorry. So if you just take the upper, upper left panel, that's um, a, a scatter diagram. And on the bottom axis here, it shows the, the March value, so six months in advance, or actually nine months in advance, uh, value of the Pacific Meridional mode, so whether it's positive or negative. And then the x-axis shows you Nino three uh, uh, sea surface temperatures. And so what you can see, this is now taking all the NMME forecasts. This is the whole NMME suite. Um, I'll talk about the odds in a minute. And so the blue 
basically are all of those cases where um, uh, the uh, PPM, uh, the Pacific Meridional Mode, is uh, negative, and um, uh, you can see the distribution of uh, Nino 3 temperatures, and what you find is that there is some, some hint that's slightly over the, the square box is the average of all the blues. There's some hint that there's a, a, a negative bias when you have a, a negative PPM. There's a slightly greater probability of uh, predicting a cold Nino 3 temperatures. Warm events, the picture is a little, a little bit more clear. So if you have a, a positive PPM, then, then uh, there's a, a higher, much higher probability of, of capturing a warm event. In fact, you can see almost, almost all, uh, all positive, positive PPMs result in, 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 uh, in warm events. And the, um, on this picture, the upper left, these open circles, uh, they correspond um, to the um, uh, observed um, Nino 3 temperatures and the observed PPM, and the closed circles correspond to the NMME PPM and the NMME uh, Nino 3 temperatures. And um, we can even, um, we can see that in the March forecast, we can see to a lesser degree that relationship holding in the January forecast. So, so this is a whole, a whole year in advance of the event, so it's a pretty long, pretty, pretty long lead. And if you separate that out in terms of um, uh, Nino 3 versus Nino 4, so in some sense the, the CP Central Pacific El Ninos versus the um, Eastern Pacific El Ninos, then, then the picture gets much more cloudy and um, um, not so much uh, uh, utility in the uh, PMM. But, um, but uh, if you just, you know, do st in her paper she does some nice statistics of percent correct and those kinds of things, and um, that, that, looks, that really does look uh, encouraging in terms of the forecast. So these are some of the issues, uh, just going back is, you know, uh, this white paper should highlight, you know, what needs to be done to make predictability use uh, useful for operational prediction, and what I would argue, uh, just based on these results, <laughs> stop at this first paper and just say, well, it's a precursor, and throw it over the fence and say, good luck. You really, we should really be encouraging people to actually attack the real forecast problem as um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, making it useful for, for real prediction. Um, so that's it. I've, I've, I've gotten the hook in terms of um, out of time. Uh, so this is sort of the, uh, the status of uh, uh, the NMME project and, and also the Climate Prediction Task Force. And just to remind you, the Climate Prediction Task Force has these two things that are, we're really working hard on that white paper, but we're also searching for that, you know, um, uh, we're, in fact, I'm writing the uh, prospectus for this uh, virtual uh, workshop on bias correction um, uh, that we're hoping to host very soon. And I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ben. A lot of a lot of excellent updates in there, particularly with the uh, upgrades to the NMME system, um, especially since even the October CDPW meeting. Um, which also, I'll, I'll plug uh, our webinar website. We have recordings of all the webinars up, and I think that uh, Ben's talk from October is up on our website. If anybody wants to take a look at that or any of the other talks from the from the series. So I put a call out for questions from individuals on the uh, phone line. I haven't heard anything yet, so we'll see if anybody in the room has a question for Ben. We have time for probably one quick question. Okay, nothing here, so I'll wait a few more seconds in case anybody's typing anything into the chat feature. Again, if you're having trouble finding that, you go to the top of the screen and um, the box will come down and you can select chat and then you can send me a chat message with a question. Okay. Don't want too much dead air. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Ben, um, for the presentation. Sure. Okay. Going to move on to Bean next. Bean, you're on the line? Yes. Okay. I'm going to transfer mm -hmm. control over to your computer. So, uh, Bean, can you hit the share my desktop button? Yes, I just clicked. Okay, great. Let 
and then just uh, bring your slides back up. Okay. Great, looks good. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dan and all audience. Um, this is going to be a discussion of the predictability of the Asian summer monsoon rainfall. And I'm trying to introduce a new method to estimate this predictability, also combined with uh, predictions. Co-author Jin Li have moved to uh, Busan National University, and Bao Jiang has moved to uh, GFDL recently. Um, this is uh, a diagram showing the four models listed here, and they are MME skills for rainfall forecast during this handcast period. Over this Asian Australia monsoon region, the area averaged scale is 0.31, <coughs> not very high, especially over land. So a question is to what extent the Asian summer monsoon rainfall is predictable? We will use the predictable mode analysis method to estimate. And what is this PMA? This is an integral approach combining empirical analysis, physical interpretation, and handcast experiment. The empirical analysis detects most important modes of variability, and physical interpretation tend to establish their physical basis and establish a physics-based empirical models for prediction. And the retrospective predictions by either empirical model or dynamic models are used to identify whether those major modes of variability are predictable or not. Then the potential predictability can be estimated by those predictable modes. The sum of the frictional variance are counted by those predictable modes. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, studies before to test this idea. Uh, so I'm going to discuss what is the major modes and how to interpret them, and what about the handcast experiment use dynamic models and, and PE model, physical empirical model, estimate the predictability and handcast scale after bias corrections, combine this predictability and prediction. Now this is the four leading UF mode of, of rainfall in this Asian Australian monsoon domain for JGA. And each of those patterns has interannual variability, except this last pattern seems has a trend. And how to interpret those? If you look at their friction of variance, uh, they are um, total account for uh, about 50% of the total variance, close, is 47%. Now the first mode, this is spatial structures, enhance the rainfall here and decrease the rainfall there. And this is, if, if they correlate it with uh, <coughs> the sea surface temperature, you see this is a cold sea surface temperature in the equatorial central Pacific and warm SSD over the maritime continent, warm pool regions. So this is really uh, during the Central Pacific Enso development and produce this uh, rainfall pattern. And the second EUF is closely related to the cooling in the Western Pacific and the warming in the Northern Indian Ocean. And this is the anticyclonic anomalies coupled with this Indian Ocean dipole, which mainly produce these patterns. I will elaborate shortly. Uh, in more detail. And the third UF is basically correlated with the Indian Ocean SSG dipole mode. And the last one is, is a warming over the warm pool region. It is a signal of a global warming. So let me elaborate why we call EUF1 is a forced response to CP cooling. As I showed that this, this mode is associated with this SSC pattern. And if we take a cooling here, force an AGCM, uh, we can basically reproduce this anticyclonic, this high pressure, this anticyclonic 
anomaly here, and also surprised convection and enhanced convection over this region, which is similar to this UFM pattern. The, the, the second pattern, we, we emphasize the Indo-Pacific warm pool copper mode. And the, the, the key is that <coughs> this anticyclonic anomaly is often excited in the material phase of ENSO. And in the decaying phase ENSO, uh, they can maintain themselves through this anticyclonic circulation uh, interact with the cooling and the warming. There is a positive feedback to maintain both SSD dipole and anticyclonic. And even the ENSO force and decaying, but locally they can produce this rainfall anomaly pattern. And the third mode, of course, mainly is produced by this Indian Ocean dipole and the correlated rainfall anomalies. Um, so um, I want to see that uh, uh, the handcast uh, using physical empirical model and dynamic models, MME, for, for dynamic models, uh, we just uh, analyze their uh, first four PCs and use observed spatial pattern uh, replace their model spatial pattern because the model spatial pattern has biases. But the PCs are predicted by the, the dynamic models. So use the first four models to uh, make uh, two-dimensional rainfall predictions. The DSIG model is the same idea. Use the um, observed spatial pattern times predicted principal component, then add them together. So the physical empirical model, uh, we have to, uh, to pick up the predict predictors. So the predictor for UF1 is this tendency, SS cooling in the Central Pacific. As we argued, this is a force by the Central Pacific uh, SST cooling. So this is the May minus March tendency. And another uh, auxiliary uh, predictors is the NAO index, because the NAO uh, during spring, um, uh, they can affect the Equatorial Central Pacific SST through generation of uh, this anticyclonic anomalies affect the trade wind. So this two predict UF1. For UF2, I argue this is uh, uh, anticyclone interact with the dipole. So we look at the April, May, this SST dipole, only one predictors. And for UF3, we use May minus March SST tendency in this two box to predict the development of Indian Ocean dipole. For the fourth mode is, is the average uh, SST or from January through May. This is the position SST because this mode is, is, is has, has, has a trend type of pattern. So given this four empirical models, uh, we have tested the cross-validated. Um, the black curve here is the, uh, um, the, the observed PC, observed PC1 and observe PC2, PC3, PC4. And the empirical models is this uh, dashed red. And this is the cross-validated scale. And the four models MME scale for PC1 actually is higher. Now this is a combination of this empirical model and MME scale. So this is for PC2 and PC3, PC4. And in general, you see that the combined scales tends to be higher, can reach to 0.7 or 0.8. And for the first and the third mode, the dynamic models captures better than empirical models. But the empirical models, uh, the PE models capture better PC2 and especially this PC4. Now, in other words, 
either use PE model or use dynamic model. This four uh, uh, EUS mode seems to be predictable. So we call them predictable mode. Therefore, we can use them to estimate. So what is the predictable mode? Let me summarize that. Uh, <coughs> this is a two example. One is the 200 hectopascal geopotential height for a summer time. And this is the scale score captured by the dynamic model, MME. And this is the percentage variance. The first EF captures 33% of the friction variance. And it can be very well predicted by the dynamic models. And this is the second mode, this is the third, this is the fourth. So in general, the first four mode, the model has a skill score around 0.4 or higher. And this skill score is considered both spatial structure prediction and, and PC uh, temporal correlations. So we identify maybe this four mode is distinct, distinguishable for, from those model cannot capture and they are carry less frictional variance. So so this is a four predictable mode. For Asian winter monsoon, two meter air temperature over entire Asia, there are basically two modes are predictable and others are not. So in this case we can also identify the first four modes, do a similar uh, pictures. So we can use this uh, dynamic MA, ME uh, to make uh, predictions. If we use all modes, this is the prediction scale I showed is 0.331. And if we use just the first four predictable mode, uh, but we crack the bias in the spatial patterns, and the scale actually uh, is a little bit higher, especially over the land area. And the residual mode has uh, uh, small contributions. So let's use this for predictable mode to estimate the potential uh, or practical potential predictability. And also look at the uh, <coughs> forecast scale. This is the uh, empirical model estimate uh, <coughs> this is the, uh, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. This is the empirical model used the first four modes to make a prediction. The prediction scale is something like this, 0.36. And if you use the MME four models, is 0.39. And a combination of these two may up to a little bit higher, but the maximum uh, scale use observed perfect for, mod, for mode to uh, to calculate the, sc the, the scale is 0.55. So the potential predictability estimated by PMA is showing this panel. In a large area, I would see uh, there are uh, more than maybe 30, 40 percent. Now this is another predictability estimated by uh, Aaron Kumar's uh, approach called mean square error method. And this is uh, use multi-model, uh, uh, multi-model uh, dynamic models, uh, ensemble prediction. Uh, and this is higher uh, if we assume this first four model can be perfectly predicted. Um, this shows the PCC scale as a function of time for each of the years. Correlation scale. <coughs> for observations, empirical models, multi-model, uh, ensemble, and combined scale. Um, the last one is I uh, try to predict the all Indian rainfall index uh, using, using this, uh, this is observation. And this is empirical model, multi-model MME, and a combination of them. Empirical model actually only four or five predictors, but they tend to do a reasonable job to capture this uh, all Indian rainfall index. So conclude, 
Four major modes of Asian summer monsoon rainfall variability have been identified. One is the forced by Central Pacific Ansel development mode, another is the Indo Pacific couple mode, Indian Ocean dipole and global warming mode. Total explains about half of the total variance. These four modes are to a large extent may be predictable uh, with basically based the empirical model and with MME of four state of art dynamic models. So the dynamic and the PE models are complementary. There are combined model obtain average pattern correlation score about 0.5. And the predictability is largely come from the four predictable modes. The PMA method may provide a useful approach for estimate of seasonal potential predictability in comparison with the uh, uh, conventional approach based on dynamic model and sample. Simulation. Thank you. I want to stop here. Uh, thank you for any questions or comments. Great. Thanks a lot, Bean, for the uh, interesting presentation. So I actually do have a question from uh, virtual attendees from Tim Del Sol, Bean. Um, his question is, can you give a few more details of your PMA? Does this method assume that different models have the same EOFs? Um, uh, yes, let me go back to uh, yes. The uh, uh, the major modes you identify from observations, not from models. Short answer is yes. And uh, yeah, okay. So. So this is uh, uh, a description of the PMA method. Empirical analysis to determine the major mode variability. Then trying to understand their origin, whether those patterns are physically meaningful. And if they are meaningful, can, what, can we uh, establish PE models to predict them? Then use dynamic model handcuffed or PE models to, to, to see to what extent those major patterns are predictable. Now, if they have uh, practically useful skills, we assume those modes may be predictable. Of course, it depends upon the model physics and the model skills. When the model becomes better, they may be captured better. And uh, uh, then we can use this for observed pattern, or we think they are predictable to estimate predictability. I don't know okay. whether I answered the question. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, I unmuted Tim. I don't know if he has a follow-up, he can um, he can ask now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, ben, can you go to the slide where you have the equations for this method? There. Okay. Um, so in the, your first equation, you have a WI. That's the the observed EOF pattern. Is that correct? Yes. And then the PCI. How do you figure that out? Well, the PCI is. Uh, <coughs> I mean, from empirical model, of course, you use the predictors this. So when we have the predictors for 13 years, uh, we will be able to do that, to make the predictions. So this is for your statistical model. I'm curious about how you do that for the dynamical model. For the dynamic model, you have a, <coughs> you have a predictive field. Then we have to project it to this observed pattern to, to get uh, uh, to get this PC. Okay, so you're saying you simply take the observed UF, project it on the model, and use that amplitude as a forecast. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, Tim, uh, for the question. And I think since we're a little bit after 3 o'clock, uh, we'll, we'll conclude for today. Uh, Bean, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. 
And uh, thanks to all three of our speakers. I think it was a very interesting webinar and great to hear all of these updates on, uh, on what folks are up to, a lot of good stuff going on. So we have two webinars. We're going to overwhelm you with webinars next month. We have two coming up in short order on uh, April 4th. This one, the date may change, so check out the MAP website, um, the webinar website, where we'll update the date in case it does change. And the topic of the, uh, the topic of this first webinar is Model Infrastructure for Improved Performance and Interoperability, and we're going to hear from Cecilia DeLuca from Ezrel, uh, Noah Ezrel, Mark Iridel from NOAA Environmental Modeling Center, and then uh, Balaji from GFDL. And then on April 8th, the following week, uh, there's a webinar on climate extremes, understanding and predicting high impact conditions. And this is co-hosted with the Earth System Science Program here in uh, CPO. And we have a number of speakers for that webinar. We're gonna hear from Gabe Becky from GFDL, Chris Thorncroft from University of Albany, Scott Weaver from uh, Climate Prediction Center, and Kinsey Moe also from the Climate Prediction Center. So, uh, going to be busy in early April, and I hope that um, I hope these are of interest and that uh, everyone joins back. And again, please look for details on the MAP website, including um, recordings and also links to these future webinars so that you can log on to the WebEx. So, thanks everyone for attending, and thanks again to the speakers, and we'll talk to you in April.